Okie doke. Well, welcome everybody. And um, let's see, before I get started with the news, does anybody have anything they want to they wanna bring up? Yep, Bill? Yeah, can you, yeah, you can hear me okay, right? Yeah. Um, I, I would like to share my desktop. I uh, have gotten a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, there's a, a battery pack I, uh, uh, that was donated. So, so share screen. Let me see whether I can find it. How do I? Okay. Okay. There's a, there, there's a, a battery pack. Um, and this is uh, 2S8P, right? You see in the upper right corner. Uh, I'm not getting. Yeah, I see okay. it. I see it. Uh huh. Am I mute? No, I'm not muted. So, and ignore the heavy black line. The the data in the right side was uh, the the voltages of each of the all the all, this is a 24 volt pack, and all the voltages from top to bottom were 24 something. I, I don't remember exactly 23.67 or so, but the individual cells in a string of two were out of balance by as much as uh, 0.7 volt. Uh, and I found that, and, and I, you know, I probably made all the mistakes in the world when I, um, when I hooked it up, this was a maintenance charge on 12, I'm sorry, 16 huge batteries. And, and the, the graphs in the middle and on the right uh, were the voltage uh, differences between the top and bottom battery before and after I put a heavy jumper, which is the heavy black line connecting the midpoint of the two batteries, right? And these two graphs are scaled equally. So you can see the actual difference in voltage drop down significantly. And, uh, and then I actually went out this morning. I have a, a, a 2S4P battery pack and on the lower left side I have similar behavior that is the difference between the top cell and the bottom cells was kind of all over the map right in some cases the top battery was higher voltage in some cases the bottom battery was higher higher voltage and I intend upon uh, putting a jumper midway on that also uh, similar to this I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but uh, yeah, similar to this thing going across the heavy black line in the, in the uh, schematic. And I just wondered whether anyone else who has a lead acid pack uh, has ever checked this out uh, and done anything about it. Am, am I understanding you right where you're saying the voltages between individual cells within a battery or between two different batteries? between two different batteries. These are seal, sealed deep cycle uh, lead uh, batteries uh, donated from some guy that had solar. Okay, and, and what I, you're finding is before charge or after charge, you've got a difference in, in voltages? Yes. I mean, we're applying 24 volts, right? But, and, and these are used batteries. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, for some unknown reason, um, it, it kind of got out of whack. And uh, you'll note that I'm putting the charge controller diagonally, right? Uh, at some point, we made the mistake of running a six, uh, 300 watt load, but we had the inverter connected midway in the pack. And that, that was incorrect also. We, we should have connected the inverter diagonally also. And, uh, but I deduced and correctly so that by adding this jumper midway, it, it sort of equal, equalizes everything. Okay, I, I may not be understanding exactly, but I know when you hook up batteries with different voltage together, like in, in, um, in parallel, is that what you're doing yeah. there? Um, yeah. That they, the, the voltages will tend to equalize between the batteries, yes. right. All right? Is that what you're finding or am I, am I not following what you're saying there? Well, but you see, I have, it's 2S, two batteries in series and eight parallel sets. Right. And had this have been 8P, just eight in parallel, 
That's exactly correct, what you said. But the, since this is two cells in series, I got this imbalance and I corrected it by adding the, the jumper oh. midway. I see. So even after they were connected in parallel, you were getting an imbalance between the sets? Right. Oh, okay. And then by I, adding... I was, getting, I, I was getting 24 volts. That wasn't an imbalance, but the individual cells were not half of the series voltage. They were, they were spread out high and low from that voltage. Okay. When you tested them individually, even when they're connected together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I and think I, 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 and then by yeah. adding another jumper, you know, a, a heavier gauge connection between, is that what you're doing there? It, it, it was not a heavy gauge. It was a, a, a low gauge wire with alligator clips. Oh, okay. And that was basically making a, a, another parallel connection, right? Well, another connection between the midpoints. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm so sure in, instead of just hooking up the the positive and negatives of the series together, you were basically connecting the connection between the series in parallel to each other. Um. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I really don't. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm sure somebody out there maybe has a 24 or 48 volt system and they, they charge it at 48 volts and uh, never uh, checking the individual battery vo voltages in a string, you know, in the series string. Yeah. And I found it interesting that they 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 weren't balanced. And and indeed on this 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 one on the lower left, 2S4P, I ran into the same thing. And I'm gonna correct that by putting a jumper uh midway. Like, like, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but yeah, the heavy black see. line represents yeah. that. Does anybody because clearly, I mean, I'm struggling even to just formulated in my mind what's going on here. I think I got it now, but anybody have any input for, for Bill? I do. All right, yeah. In the automotive end, which I, <clears throat> when, a, when you're not functioning properly off electrical system and it's directed towards the batteries, one third of the time, it's your connection. The connection to the battery, even though it looks solid, if you would take it open and then clean down to the copper and reassemble it, and they even have conductive solutions you could put into this. And if that's not it, then the connection to the connector to the battery always seems to be problematic also. And, and when you introduce a mechanical connection like a alligator clip, then at that point, it's, it's questionable. So. I always start at the beginning at the connection to the batteries to make them solid and, and I wouldn't use the alligator clips. But sure. so if, if, if it's wired in parallel, it's, as you said, all of the voltages remains the same, but, but you, the only way you can check it is by removing the wires because when they're all hooked in parallel, then you can't connect, you can't measure the series properly until it's uh, free from that. Am I close, Jay? Well, it, I guess what you're saying makes sense. If there's increased resistance in one of the connection points, that would tend to lower the voltage, uh, you know, for that, for that particular thing that it's connected to. So, you know, that, that makes a certain amount of sense to me. I don't know, Bill, does that make sense to you that the connection might be just a little bit getting more resistance at that point? Uh, it does. Uh, uh, Gabe and I have discussed this, and it might be a very small resistance imbalance. Um, but nevertheless, if you look at these two graphs, right, adding yeah. the jump.
jumper midway. In fact, on the after the jumper was put put midway, the maximum deviation was uh, a tenth of a volt. Whereas in the in the larger graph, the, the the maximum deviation difference between the top battery and the bottom battery was almost 0.7 volt. Uh -huh. So the thing, so the thing you changed was the connection. I added well, you, the jumper. You added a second midway. connection. It looks like. Yeah. To me, aren't you adding another parallel connection though when you when you jump in those middles? So you're basically giving a better parallel connection. I, I, well, I, I I'm, I, I can't. <laughs> this is the reason I'm asking the experts because <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, if if you if I look at your diagram there. The, you're connecting basically you're going along the series connection between the positive and the negative of the two batteries is that right in the middle that's right right i'm okay, so when those, you those when wires. you make another parallel connection along that you're basically connecting all of the positives and all of the negatives in the middle in parallel in addition to the parallel connections on the outside isn't isn't that right yeah that's right Okay, so you're giving yourself a redundant parallel connection. So maybe what Bob's saying is one of your parallel connections, you know, is is bad on the exterior. So by giving it a redundant pathway, you're reducing some of that resistance. That could well be the case. We we just kludged this up rapidly because this guy got these 16 batteries and they're huge, too, too heavy for two people. Yeah. And um and and we just I said we got to put a maintenance charge on it, you know, just to keep them topped off. But then I, I was actually surprised to discover the same thing on a battery pack in the backyard that I have, where the deviation was almost 0.7 volt on one cell, and 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 you know you see it's it's it reverses and so on and so forth. Anyway. Yep. Well, I wonder I, if you increase the size of the wires on your exterior yeah. connections, if you would get if you would get some reduction on that as well, you know, without the jumpers. And uh, clean we, all we, the connections with that. the wire brush. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a related question, and I, I do think it's likely going to be some resistance in the wires or connections, but um, in in uh, some of the materials. I've seen it recommended that you connect your charge controller to a battery bank at the opposite end from where your inverter is taking um, power from the batteries. And my, my system isn't configured like that. I actually have my um, charge controller connected um, very close to where the batteries connect to the, uh, to the inverter, if, if not in the same place. And I haven't experienced any problems at all. And um, you know, one of the students last night asked about if in that scenario where the charge controller is at the opposite end of the battery bank, you know, where the electrons are, are basically coming from. And, and basically my answer was if, you know, unless you have some resistance in your wiring, you know, it's just all going through the path of least resistance. And you know, your solar panel can go directly to your load and bypass your batteries. And like I said, unless you have wiring uh, resistance. But anyway, any any additional thoughts on that? Do you, do you think it, I'm missing something by not having my charge controller at the opposite end of my battery bank from my inverter? It, it doesn't sound like it would be to me. I mean, I know that there is a lot of discussion about that all of your connection wires should be the same length, um, mm -hmm. you know, within your battery bank to avoid differences in resistance. But as long as, I mean, I don't, I don't see why that would cause an issue as long as your wires are big enough, you know. Yeah. Again, that's one reason why you always use four-aught wires typically in a battery uh, bank even though right. it doesn't need that much usually yeah. for, for amperage. So yeah. I, I can't see why it would be, but then that's not my area of expertise. <coughs> so, all right. Okay, well, let me jump in. If we're done with that, let me jump into some of the news this week. Um, 
wasn't a whole lot. Last week, we had a whole bunch of legislation, but I found a couple of things I thought were interesting. Uh, one is that Duracell is now jumping into the uh, solar battery world. So they've announced a line of residential energy storage systems, lithium ion, uh, phosphate, uh, 14 kilowatt hour battery bank. So we're starting to see some of those mainstream. And in that same vein, uh, ADT, the security people just bought SunPro. Um, so they're jumping into the solar installation world. So we're starting to see a lot of name brand companies getting into the solar marketplace. And I ran across a product, I had never seen this before, but I thought it looked pretty cool, called uh, Earthos, Earthos, uh, E-R-T-H-O-S. It's a railless mounting system for um, primarily utility scale systems uh, mounted directly on the ground. Uh, they, it looks like when I looked at the videos and the like, they put down these uh, concrete, basically concrete rails, looks like, in, onto the ground, mount the panels directly to the concrete, run the wire through holes that are drilled in the concrete. Uh, it's, it's flat right on the ground. They claim it takes half the time to install, half Good the time. cost. Uh, no digging, so no disruption below the Earth's surface, which could be an issue in some places. Um, no wind resistance because it's lying flat on the ground. Uh, takes up a third of the land because, of course, there's no inner row spacing issues. And, um, and there's no visual line of sight. You know, it lies flat there, so you don't get some of the resistance that you might get from neighbors or whatever, unless they happen to be flying overhead, then it looks like a great big solar pond. Um, they're claiming install less than 50 cents per watt for these systems. So uh, the, only, the only issue I really saw there was um, water, you know? I mean, when you start mounting things directly on the ground, uh, if you're in an area that is subject to any kind of flooding, those things might be underwater pretty quick. But but my guess is this is for a more arid environment, you know, some of the desert southwest or whatever. There might be some with passive cooling, you know, that might be an issue because there's no easy airflow there. Um, they did have a, it had a cute little robot cleaner that's part of the yeah, whole system. Yeah. So this little robot cleaner went out every night and cleaned the panels. They came <laughs> claimed less than 1% loss over the life of the system due to soiling. So we're taking a look at it. Anybody have any comments on that particular product? Yeah, Bill? I, I've run across a situation where a, uh, a, uh, a, a an array on a wooden structure, a big array on a wooden structure peeled off in an in a extreme weather event. And they had actually bolted the panels together, you know, bolted them down, but also connected them uh, left and right. And um, the question arises, why did this whole thing peel off? And this, this was probably uh, 40 yards wide. Uh, and I, I personally think thermal expansion might have played in because, you know, an aluminum structure 40 yards wide will grow and retract due to thermal heating. And it might have weakened the lag bolts that uh, connected it to a wooden structure. And uh, But I assume these people have uh, taken that into consideration and maybe their gap, you know, to where it doesn't grow as one long object, but each of the panels grow but it, it, thermally but not push on the next one I yeah I, when i tackle that when i looked at the picture it did look like there were you know top-down mounting bolts you know between the panels so it wasn't that they were locked you know one panel bolted to the other which would seem to be yeah. a hard way to install a system you know that i can't see that reducing much install time when you got you got to lift them up, connect them together. So, 
I don't know. It was interesting. It might be one of those things, one of those innovations that really, really does reduce some of the issues in utility scale, or it might be just somebody looking for a gimmick and, uh, and not really, you know, finding its niche in the, um, in the marketplace. Be interesting so, on a south facing uh, uh, landscape with a oh, little bit of a little bit of a, uh, a slope to it. Yeah, although you'd have to have a pretty uniform plane, I would imagine. Um, that's another issue they didn't really address because you know the rails allow you to even out some of that um, uh, imperfections in the ground or on, on a building. So, you know, unless you've got a perfectly level um, space, and I, I'm sure with, with the kind of equipment you would have on, on a huge utility scale, you could probably make that happen. But um, I think in this region where I'm at, and certainly where Bill is there in Houston, where you get nothing but rain, you know, I, I can't see that being practical having your panels right down on the ground. Okay. All right. So does anybody else have anything before I jump in? Uh, yeah, Bob. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> according to a whole bunch of uh, YouTube uh, videos I've watched, Tesla is not giving or selling their parts to second tier uh, repair places. Uh, one of them, a guy brought the Tesla in, they wanted $22,000 for the, replacing the battery, which you can get for half that price at a second tier. But when the guy went to order parts and stuff like that, they refused it saying that you're not a factory authorized person to do any work on the Tesla. So what's happened is, is all of the boneyards with uh, banged up Teslas are filling the cracks in here at prices, inflating the prices, because supply is down. So this is for know. the electric vehicles, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So um, I don't know how it is for other Toyota and other co companies, but. Well, I, I think Tesla traditionally has had some problems with, um, certainly in their solar world, uh, you know, of, of customer service and follow through. I know I was talking to an installer here in Ohio who was a Tesla, Tesla authorized Powerwall dealer, and they just dropped the whole product because they couldn't get any customer support from Tesla. Um, they couldn't get product, they couldn't get servicing support, anything. So they just, they went through a lot of steps to become one and then didn't do it because of customer service. So... I don't know if that's something in the Tesla car world or not. I'm not not there. Um, anybody else have any any experience with Tesla? Anybody own a Tesla? No, nope. not yet. Anyway. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, my guess is uh, Elon Musk is good at innovating and marketing, but not so good at some of his follow through. They're Which too rich for my blood. Yeah. <laughs> It questioned me going up in his rocket ship if you couldn't get parts. <laughs> so, all right. Um, the, the topic I thought I would focus on here today, uh, just because in some of my reading, I've been reading a lot about flow batteries. And, um, and since we're in the world of batteries anymore, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what flow batteries are. Some of you guys may be super familiar with them. Others, it's a term that you may have heard, but not really focused on and others, it may be a new term. So let me let me share the screen here with, uh, oh, I've got the, you'll get to see my Zane State class here first. All right, um, this is kind of what a, a flow battery diagram looks like. And the way that they typically work, you've got an electrolyte tank here, an electrolyte tank here, there's a difference in um, the um, ions that flow through there. Uh, typically in the past, they've used vanadium. So they would refer to one of these, the negative, I think as the uh, vanadium eight, uh, five. 
So I guess there are, I'm not quite sure, five electrons or five extra electrons. And then over on this side would be vanadium three. So as these solutions are pumped through, it would give off an electron, which then flows through to the power source, the, I mean, the, to the load when it's discharging, service the load, it would flow back into this and it would basically go from uh, a five or a six, three to a five, four. The electrons would be given up just like you find in a chemical battery where once they we reach uh, equalization, the battery would be dead. Uh, there's a membrane here. Uh, the one difference here between a traditional um, acidic battery and this flow battery is it does give off a pro proton, like a, um, like a um, fuel cell, where it keeps these in balance as, as it's being charged or discharged. And I guess what that means is that you get this, these electrolytes can, um, can last a very, very long time. Um, the, the stack is where you would manipulate to get your charge, you know, the amount of power that you're gonna be generating or the voltage that you're gonna be generating. So once that's set, then it's really the storage capacity is just the size of the tank. So this is where it comes into play, especially in, in utility scale storage, is these parts, the, the management and the stacks are fairly small in scale. And then you can put in, you know, huge tanks of electrolyte, which would serve to store whole wind farms, whole utility scale solar, um, and, and without much cost. So let me get into some of the basics. Um, well, I mentioned the vanadium is the traditional material that's being used, which is a problem. It's a fairly expensive um, uh, metal and causes some environmental problems in, in the mining of it. But in 2020, uh, the Swedes, a Swedish research team, and there was another one in California, essentially reproduce this process using fully organic and water-based materials. So what this research tends to show is that this type of technology can become completely benign as far as it, the environment is concerned. Um, some of these are, are fully organic, you know, coming from grain-based um, material. And, and they are water-based and they're fully recyclable. So once the solution has been used up, uh, it can be rejiggered, recycled. Uh, but they do say that these typically have a 25 year life with no loss of, um, of functionality and unlimited cycles during that life. life uh, and it can go almost to 100% depth of discharge. So there are some super advantages there um, if the electrolytes tend to mix, if there's a problem and they mix, nothing happens. Um, it's non-acidic. There's no self-discharge. So if you're not using it, it does not lose its state of charge over time, which is a big deal there as well. Um, and problems tends to have a very low energy density. So it's not for something, you know, certainly not for uh, electric vehicle or something like that, or anything that requires a light um, mobile energy source. Um, they do have longer durations. So they're, they're looking at some of these, they said at a utility scale, typically utility scale lithium ion has about a four hour life cycle. So they are just for temporary power outages. Uh, these 10, at least the models today, have about a 12 hour. Um, they're cheaper. There's no heating and cooling requirements on these. So you don't have to worry about waste heat as part of it. Uh, one of the big advantages right now commercially is these things are available at about $60 per kilowatt hour compared to about $120 per kilowatt hour for lithium. Um, 
So at the utility scale, these things seem super promising because you really don't have space constraints. You don't have, you know, you put up a couple of big uh, water tower looking things or grain silo things with the electrolyte and everything else is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I did want to do a little bit of research on the residential scale because that tends to be where we're focused. And there are some companies out there touting. Uh, there's an American company called Volt Storage that's touting their um, flow batteries. They've got a 6.2 kilowatt hour. Uh, they said 10,000 or more cycles, recyclable, non-flammable. That's just part of it. It is vanadium based, so it has some of the issues as far as cost. Could not find any of them in any pricing or commercially available. So this sounds like a startup where it's all marketing hype at the moment, whether it works or not. Another one that had a lot of hype was Redflow, and that's an Australian based company. They had a um, 10 kilowatt hour system. Uh, it is zinc bromide as opposed to um, vanadium um, and the same recyclable, non-flammable, all of that. Uh, for a 10 kilowatt hour, it was, it was 290 kilograms, which kilograms, what, 2.2 pounds. So you're talking 650 pounds or so for this unit for essentially a little bit smaller than a Tesla Powerwall. So it would be about um, three times the weight, um, two and a half, three times the weight of a Tesla Powerwall. So that's your energy density issues. So at a residential level, I, my guess is for a whole house battery, you'd be looking at like the equivalent of two hot water heaters in your house. That's probably- That sounds good, but um, I mean, you could plan for that. I mean, we have like, that would have to be outside too, right? Like, like, uh, well, there's the question because there is no safety issue with these. Okay. So, so that's where I was thinking that if they're going to start moving batteries outside because of the, apparently they consider an inherent danger, could there be an exception for flow batteries where there's no safety concern? So that might create a market, you know, I don't want my batteries outside. I want them in my house. Right. And you have space usually by your water heater and furnace anyway, right? Could, could be downstairs, uh, like Don, you know, everything goes downstairs. So his, um, it's certainly less space and size than a um, lead acid battery system, you know, or, or maybe about the same because uh, the lead acid's pretty heavy and pretty big. Did you get a price on that red flow? Yeah, I couldn't find the red flow. The only commercially available um, system I found was a Chinese manufacturer, uh, and it was a five kilowatt hour for 12,500. So very pricey comparatively. If you compare that to say a Tesla Powerwall, Tesla Powerwall, if, if my memory serves is like a 13 kilowatt hour battery, and like it, eight, right? No, I think the new ones are 13, or 13. maybe I'm thinking LG Chem. But either way, those things tend to run in the five or six thousand dollar range. So this would be four times the cost at the moment, but it's a new technology. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that changes. What is your I, I didn't understand where the protein source was if you didn't have uh, hydrogen ions in a um, acid. You mean where the proton source would be? Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, I, I watched some videos on it, and I guess part of the process of dislodging uh, the electron from the electrolyte, because because the way these work, your power source is used to um, through an electrolysis type process to release the electron and it releases the hydrogen at the same time. The hydrogen flows across the membrane and the electron flows um, to the source when it's released. 
Um, so in one case, you're recombining the electrons in, when you're charging it. And I guess when you're discharging it, you're releasing it. Um, so I guess in the process of releasing the electron, a hydrogen molecule, um, a hydrogen ion, because it's a, it's a proton without an electron is released. So um, it didn't really state why that hydrogen was important other than it said it kept the charge between the two electrolytes in balance. Now, I'm not quite sure what that means because obviously there's a differential in potential. That's where you get your electron, but uh, Either way, I'll just take the word for it that it works. And uh, so it's a fully reversible process. So when you put this, you see this down here where it says power source or load. When it's charging, this would be a wind farm or, an, or a solar farm. And it's throwing power into the process to create the electron imbalance between the two electrolytes. Then when you need the power, the system reverses itself and the electrons then service the load. So it's a fully reversible process. <clears throat> so any questions about flow batteries, where that comes in? Yeah, Bill? You're on mute, Bill. I'll point out that the company that makes a uh, single axis tracker called Next Tracker is incorporating flow batteries I think on each string of 40 kW. Um, I don't know what the current status is. I saw this at a trade show a year or two ago. Uh huh. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a utility scale thing. I mean, you'll see a lot of yeah. utility scale systems out there, um, you know, on YouTube or wherever. It, it sounds like a good option in that environment. Uh, I just wonder if it can be scaled down to a residential application. So, and, and that would get us into a whole new world. I, I guess, I'm not sure uh, how self-contained these things are, but then it, it's sort of a little bit like, um, like solar thermal where it's a liquid, you know, a plumbing application integrated in with an electrical application. So I don't know what that would mean to the installer. My guess is these things are just a fully self-contained unit and you wouldn't be messing with the liquids, but um, who knows? Anything I've ever had tends to leak anyway. Yeah. Is this anything related to like the salt batteries that you were here, you know, whenever we ha I had my class with you, I think you mentioned something about that and there was a base in Pittsburgh, I believe. Yeah, that's the uh, aqueous uh, saltwater batteries. And they've gone kind of dark. I mean, that was such a promising technology. Um, no, it's, it's different. It, it, it would be more similar to a lead acid battery that just simply uses a different um, internal chemistry. But no, these are, these are a different concept um, and, and have been gaining a lot of traction in utility scale because of the scalability of the system. If you want a megawatt you know, um, hour of storage, you just put in a bigger tank. If you want 10 megawatt hours of storage, you put in a bigger tank still, but the electronics um, and, and the pumps and all of that are probably pretty similar. Um, so, so the bigger you are, the cheaper the system becomes. Did you have anything there, Bill, to add to that? <laughs> you you're back on mute i'm sorry on another subject oh, okay sure um before we um, jump to that anybody else have anything on on uh on flow batteries it would be temperature sensitive so i would imagine so outside i don't know you know yeah when i saw the temperature thing they were saying essentially operating um from about 10 degrees Celsius or 10 degrees Fahrenheit to about 140. So um, it seemed like when it gets below freezing, it might be a problem. There would have to be some sort of heating process. 
Yeah, Bob, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, but not a serious one. Okay. My comment is, can we make the Atlantic Ocean an anode and the Great Lakes a cathode? <laughs> there you go. Uh-huh. And 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 uh, Wisconsin would funny. be fully fully charged. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, Bill. Yeah, uh, my comment. Um, Gabe and I had this discussion. Uh, we did a poll of, I think, fifty uh, recent installs, solar installs in Houston, and sixty-one percent included batteries after our deep freeze down here. It was not uh, near as high before the deep freeze. And I think, uh, did, did you mention or that in your area that a high percentage of installs include batteries? Yeah, it wasn't, uh, I think nationwide, it's, it's becoming, you know, 40 to 50% are including batteries. And a lot of that is coming, the literature specifically mentioned Texas after the deep freeze. Puerto Rico after the um, hurricane and California after the wildfires. So those were, um, were really driving it. Although I did see a, a presentation, one of those John Oliver um, shows that he does on the grid. And he was citing some statistics that from 2015 to 2020, uh, power outages on the grid doubled. So uh, that's, that's not a good sign when, uh, so I think everybody's becoming skeptical that the grid is going to be a reliable partner in our, um, in our world of electricity. In fact, I just saw a video, it was on battery backup and the CEO was basically saying, you shouldn't disconnect to the grid from the grid, even after you put in your batteries, because the grid is a good backup system. <laughs> I was, I was thinking, okay, that's a complete role reversal when we, when we use the grid as a backup, um, just in case our system goes down. So that was um, an interesting dynamic change. Although the infrastructure bill that was just went through is supposed to work on, uh, have, have quite a lot of money for transmission update. But that's not really going to help with your localized reliability. That's just primarily to uh, deal with the long haul transmission issue, which which is a big problem, um, where you've got um, the issue of uh, the grid connectivity and taking power sources from the Midwest, uh, primarily wind, and trying to get them to either coast. So I thought it was funny, John Oliver de de described uh, the, the uh, regional nature of the power grid, uh, similarly to Major League Baseball, where there's the, e there's the Eastern Division, the Western Division, and then jerks down in Texas who try and make up their own rules. So uh, <laughs> that, was, that was his description of the power grid. So I think it's pretty fair. <laughs> pertaining to uh, batteries, I just read a statistic I found kind of uh, surprising, saying batteries have gone down 68% in price over the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, the lithium ion batteries, we've seen a dramatic decrease in price. Although when you see those statistics, it's usually wholesale price. And that wholesale pricing has not really been translated to the consumer level yet. Um, you know, you remember when we had um, the fella, I, I've just lost his name, but he was doing the battery charging. Um, and he was saying how he can buy, he can buy lithium ion batteries for about $150 uh, a kilowatt hour of capacity, but retail it's about $700. So uh, that's quite a markup when you start seeing that kind of, um, but, but it has dropped in the last decade from about $1,100 per kilowatt hour to about 150. And they're looking for lithium ion to drop below $100 in the next two years, I think is what I've seen. So um, they keep saying the magic number is gonna be $100 a kilowatt hour. But if they don't pass those savings on at the consumer level, I don't know how much good that does us. 
Yeah, Bob. I hear there's some conversations going on in Scotland. I could be wrong. No, <laughs> with the with the cop, cop whatever it is, whatever yeah. number. About what? About batteries? About uh, global warming. I think uh, Obama went there. Uh, well, then problem solved, right? <laughs> My take on the whole thing is, is that we're not even serious because if there's no consequences, there's no reasons why anybody should change what they're doing. Yeah, I think to look to politicians to fix this problem is probably a lot of wasted hope. Um, you know, uh, my, and, and I'm maybe a little op overly optimistic that technology is going to help us through some of this. Um, I feel optimistic that a lot of the problems are, we're not gonna make the problems worse, but we're gonna live with the consequences of past behavior for the next several decades. So, um, you know, it's gonna take us that long. Even if we stop today, you know, transitioned everything to electric vehicles, transitioned the whole electrical grid to renewable, we will still have a couple decades of the consequences of, of global warming to work through the system. So, so for us old fogies, it's now more about um, resiliency than it is prevention. But hopefully we can get to the point where we're preventing it getting any worse. Um, who knows, who knows? I'm, I've been wrong about almost everything. <laughs> so Jay, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure we'll all survive past the, what was it, eleven years when the end when the end was supposed to come. Yeah. Uh, just like uh, was it like somehow we'll magically solve everything. Could be. Who knows? I mean, well, I, I when I wrote the book when the biomass hits the wind turbine, the, the first line in that book was ever since I can remember the world was about to end. You know, yeah. and, and that's kind of, it's true, you know, and it's not, you know, but, but I think we're, I, I don't know that it's an existentialist issue for those people with the resources to deal with it. But if I lived in Bangladesh, I think I'd be pretty worried if I was aware, you know, there are vulnerable areas that are going to suffer for sure, but it has always been thus. Could be, but I'll go for those guys are still buying waterfront property, so yeah, there's I know people, there, there's some uh, not surprising, a little bit of a hypocrisy someplace, but we'll see. Yeah, yep. Well, I'm I'm always able to hold four different thoughts at the same time, and most of them are conflicting and contradictory, so uh, I, I, I believe that we have a problem. I believe it's man-made, and I believe that mankind can solve it, but I also believe they probably won't. So, you know, and it's probably not as bad as people say, and it's not as good as people say. So, Jay? Um, I don't know, this is, we're getting a little existential in general on this discussion, but uh, given that the, the technology in Europe for railroads is all electric, to my knowledge, uh, it would seem to me everything west of the Mississippi would be in places where fundamentally you could do long line uh, with uh, wind or solar and uh, instead of these huge diesel electric locomotives that are huge focal power draws, put, you know, make them all into little Priuses that have their own, you know, every fifth car has an engine on it or a motor on it. But is any of that being considered and what do you think the merit would be? to have long distance uh, public transit, fully electric? Is no, no freight, just do freight trains, oh, uh, freight trains. Uh, with electric power and the old, uh, you know, the pantograph uh, electric wires. Uh, Cause it would seem like they run through places that are wide open space that are excellent for solar and wind. And um, they would get rid of all the fossil fuel and they wouldn't have to carry their own fuel. So it should help the weight of the train and such. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see the advantages of that. I mean, the disadvantage typically, as Bob has pointed out a couple of times, is there's no, 
there's no punishment for externalized cost. So is the private industry going to invest in the infrastructure to clean up their own act when there is a significant upfront cost and there's no cost for trying to milk every bit of time out of the existing technology? So you don't think that the electricity, uh, electric motors pushing those freight cars will save enough on fuel per se to capitalize the putting the wires in and such? Well, as I understand on the rails, you've got to have some sort of power source all along the rail. So, so you'd have to install, you know, that the, the third rail, the third rail of uh, politics, you know, they often make that reference. Well, that is, you don't touch the third rail because it's electrified, um, which is where the engine is getting its power from. So, isn't all, sorry, isn't no, all I, of Europe overhead wires though? I mean, it, it's the same difference, but. I, no, I don't think it's overhead wires. I mean, at least outside of the cities, you see some of those trolleys and stuff inside the city. But I remember when we lived in France, I mean, there were not electric overheads along all the rail. I don't oh, okay. know how, how those worked, but, you know, I mean, there it's a matter of, I think you're probably right over the life of the system. It's a cheaper alternative. But our companies tend to work quarter to quarter instead of 20 years in the future. So, you know, if they can milk it, hopefully this transportation thing, maybe it's all built into that because mm-hmm. that's, that is designed for that infrastructure upgrade. Um, but I'm, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I tend, I get in this debate with my wife all the time. She's a, when, when we lived in Europe, loved, and I love the, the train system and the, the local system of, of mass transit, and it worked great for us. Uh, of course, everybody around us complained and moaned that the trains were always late. And I kept saying, geez, <laughs> you got them, you know? I mean, isn't that lovely? But, um, but I just don't see America being set up for that kind Jay? of mass transit system. Jay, don't you remember it just passed an infrastructure bill, so everything's going to be just it's fine. It's going to be fine, yeah. But well, I think I think self-driving but, electric cars are maybe a better mass transit solution. All of the locomotives are diesel electric, so you already have the electric in it. So all you need to do is have a car full of batteries, with all of the car other cars having solar tops on them. Yeah. Well, there'd be a solution. Sounds like a business plan, Bob. I'll get right on it. (laughs) Yeah, Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the Houston Electric Car Club is going to interview someone from, what is it, Avis, that's going to purchase 100,000 Teslas. That's this Thursday at 6.30, and you you can do a Zoom participation okay yeah I, i've uh, um eric did you have a comment oh yeah I, I know this is most mostly electric but um since we were talking about uh global warming and everything um have you seen anything on the news about uh japan and uh they're recycling plastic to make hydrogen huh no i haven't seen that uh, so it seems like they're really going down the, the hydrogen path, you know, and fuel cells and things like that. Mm-hmm. I know a place in the ocean where there's a lot of plastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm a hydrogen skeptic um, as far as the practicality of, of fuel cell infrastructure. I always tend to believe that it's fossil fuel industry pushing it um, because most you know, they talk about green hydrogen and blue hydrogen and gray hydrogen. And, and the reality is 95% or better of all the hydrogen produced in the world comes from natural gas. So it tends to be the fossil fuel industries pushing it. But there is a problem of storage. There's a problem of transport. That said, I think there's probably a market for it, um, you know, because... I can't see practical fully electric um, airplanes, for instance, because the fuel density uh, of batteries, no matter how good it gets, is just too heavy. So, so we might find 
hydrogen being used as an alternative to fossil fuels, as an alternative to jet fuel or something like that. So for heavy- I'm gonna say, Pardon? I'm gonna ask you, are you gonna burn it or are you gonna use it for electric energy? No, you'd probably be burning it, burn it like, okay. like another fuel source. Well, I so, remember- so like, the, like the fuel shuttle, like the, like the space shuttle. Yeah, yeah, although probably, I mean, the space shuttle Lower. I know loses quite a lot of it in between from, you know, there's a lot of it lost, but yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. And, and to, to your point, Jay, uh, as kind of like integrating or supplementing, um, I remember reading, I think it was Google, um, they had their data centers powered by, um, by solar, uh, and, you know, solar panels, and it just got to be so large, the array, you know, that they went to these, um, these uh, fuel cells, and I, I guess they were more efficient, so that they were able to go and, you know, run with less space, run their, um, their data centers. So. Yeah, yeah the, um, the, the big downside on making hydrogen with, um, has always been that the energy that is produced by the burning of the hydrogen or the using of the hydrogen is typically less than the amount of energy it took to create the hydrogen in the first place. But if we get to a place where we have vast quantities of, of wind and solar that are on the grid that are having to be curtailed because there is no demand for it at that moment, then suddenly the cost of the energy to make the hydrogen becomes zero um, and, and that makes it economical. So, so I don't wanna say that there's not a place for it. I just don't think I think batteries will always be a better alternative for storing energy, but there is just so much battery you need as well. So, so then you could say, all right, let's set it up. We've got our batteries, we've got our solar, and if we've got extra, let's make some fuel that we can then ship off to, you know, power rocket ships or, or you know, airplanes or heavy equipments of some sort. So who knows? I mean, I'm sure there's a place for it, just not at the residential level. <laughs> so, all right. Jay, uh, Matt, Matt Farrell, who does a, a, a thing called Undecided on YouTube, um, just did a thing on solid storage of hydrogen. Um, that yeah. was pretty interesting. Um, but that technology is not there yet. I agree with everything you said about um, the oil industry pushing it. It's because it's what they know. You know, they don't understand these other um, energy systems. Sure, it's a At commodity that you can control and distribute. Exactly. At the yeah. beginning of the call, you mentioned that someone had purchased a solar company. I missed the name. Could you? Tell yeah, me? it was ADT. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the security guys. The security. Yeah. Wow. And who'd they purchase? Uh, Sun Pro. Sun Pro. Okay. Yeah, it was for almost a billion dollars. So wow. somebody who was doing installs made a fair fair chunk of change by yeah. selling themselves to uh, yeah. ADT. Would you let them know I'm also up for sale? <laughs> <laughs> yep, you can be bought, but not cheap, right? So, okay, well, I think we've, we've reached the hour mark. So appreciate everybody. We'll see you all next Tuesday. All right, take care. Thank you.